this computer. So we are now recording. I want to welcome everybody to our Perspectives of a Pandemic um, conversation through the lens of art with our guests, Valerie Garlick and Stacy Queen. My name is Stacy Zakin. I'm the manager of Workspace. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Workspace in a moment, but first we have a somewhat interactive um, moment for you all. Here are four pieces of artwork um, that we have hanging in our Perspectives of a Pandemic art exhibit. So I'm just gonna let you focus on one or more of them for a moment. You might wanna mute your microphone to avoid any background noise. Although throughout the presentation, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions or share anecdotes. So let's just take a minute and a half and focus on whichever image captures your, your attention. Okay, if you want to share in the chat box um, any emotions or thoughts you have based on uh, the picture that you selected. And then at the end, maybe we'll revisit this slide and you can share with us um, your thoughts about the artwork in relationship to what we discussed tonight. So moving on, uh, Workspace, who's sponsoring this event, we're owned and operated by the town of Manchester. So we're unique in that the government, the local um, municipality supports us in supporting small businesses, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and artists. And Shannon, who is on this call with um, myself and Michelle, who isn't here with us tonight, we work to create a uh, hospitable, flexible, stimulating, um, pleasant, productive, and hopefully um, aesthetically pleasing environment for people to work, to meet, to create, and to learn. So we are two and a half story building and we're, the galleries, we have three separate gallery spaces, the main gallery, um, which is kind of our lobby entrance and it's along Manchester, the main street in Manchester. So we have big glass windows um, where people can walk by and see the art. We just painted the front windows yellow um, and we're drawing people in, which is lovely. And we're committed to showcasing a variety of art and artists. We do this through exhibits and programs in person and online. We're trying to get more adept at virtual experiences. And really, we're hoping to grow into a community of artists. And our mission is to build community, provoke thought, allow a space for people to express emotions, um, shift perspectives, inspire creativity, stimulate conversation, while fostering inclusion and providing joy, and hopefully reflecting and inspiring social change. So what we want to provide is um, opportunities for artists to develop and showcase and hopefully sell their work and to turn their passion for art into a profitable, profitable business. We want community members to experience the impact of art, whether it's creating it or viewing it um, and the diversity of arts. And then we want groups to have a place to see, discuss and experience and create art and benefit. Um, from art. 
this is one of the programs that we're hoping to do more of. Um, and before we officially launch and welcome the, the speakers and your contribution to the conversation, Shannon's going to introduce some agreements for how we can have a respectful um, conversation on a what could be a pretty sensitive topic. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we're really looking forward to what I know is going to be a great conversation. And before we get started, I just wanted to um, have us kind of build some consensus on Greece. We're hold up. Um, I want to remind everybody to share the air. So if you are somebody who's comfortable speaking and you know a lot, please speak your truth. Please, when you're talking, try to use I statements. Um, so speak uh, about your own experiences. Rather than the judgment, uh, I encourage you to listen with curiosity, right? So um, don't so much speak to be heard. Listen to what people are saying and give a pause before you respond. Expect and accept discomfort and non sure That's the thing going to be talking about tonight, our personal, our emotional. So um, get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. And um, of course, we want to just keep creating and keep the conversation going. So tonight we're um, in this space. I'm encouraging you all to be as brave and respectful as possible. Um, if somebody says something that um, we don't agree with, we want to kind of lean into that and, and talk about why something we Rather than think about this as an opportunity to learn from each other as we're all sharing our personal experiences on the dirt and we and we learn from it. So sound good to everybody? Sounds good. Yes. All right. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, Shannon. You were going in and out there a little, but I think everybody gets the um gist. And I'm gonna give an example. Um I was with a group of friends and in grad school. And I use the expression, I feel gypped. And my friend really vehemently attacked me for using that terminology because her family um, had a background of gypsies and gypped means, was referring to the fact that gypsies rip people off. And she was very much insulted by it. I had never in my life understood the, the, the word and I want to take responsibility for my impact of using the word, but I was completely ignorant. And instead of educating me in a way that built me up, she publicly tore me down. So instead of being able to make amends to her for my inappropriate language, I then, I was so humiliated, um, it really got in the way. So we want to recognize that everybody here is here for goodwill and, um, Hopefully it will prompt some honest conversation for those who just joined us. This is being recorded, so you should know that. Um, but just, you know, again, with curiosity and respect, and we don't know uh, what we don't know. And obviously we're all here to learn. So that is kind of exciting. And we're learning from two very uh, talented and experienced and insightful people. I'm gonna introduce uh, Stacy Queen who has a history here in Connecticut. She's currently a consultant at the Amistad Center, but um, previously she was the um, education associate there. Currently, she is the public programs manager at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum in Columbus, Ohio. And that museum, um, not only is it dedicated to the veterans experience, uh, they received international recognition for its innovative design, named one of the most anticipated buildings of 2018 by Architectural Digest. And although we're not going to talk a lot about the importance of um, aesthetic in terms of space, which we focus on a, as much as we can at workspace, um, but art takes all forms. There's the art hanging on the walls. There's um, you know, the way that a, a place is designed and the thought and intention that goes around building buildings and gardens and things like that. So um, Stacy has served as programs coordinator at the National Great Blacks in Wax Museum, museum educator at the Maryland Historical Society and visitor services associate at the Baltimore Museum of Art. She's also held positions in audience engagement and visitor experience 
at the Daughters of the American Revolution Museum and the Maryland Science Center and was K through eight visual arts educator in the Baltimore City Public School System. So her breadth of experience as well as her geographical um, experience is broad. She herself is an artist with a background in photography coupled with her research in gender studies, race and African American identity and representation in visual arts. And um, we're looking forward to hearing more about her experience in relationship to this topic. Our second speaker is Valerie Garlick, who's the instructor of art and gallery curator at Capital Community College, which I used to know as G Fox when I uh, grew up here. She is um, born and raised in Connecticut, studied art, uh, Tungsis Community College, Eastern and Central Connecticut State University and completed her graduate work at UConn. She's been involved in the arts for a decade and worked at Real Artways, the Carriage Barn Art Center and the Institute Library in New Haven. Again, shout out for Connecticut and how many fabulous arts uh, locations and organizations we have. And she's a proponent of bringing together the arts and community, spearheading work with the movement called Nasty Women CT, as well as currently serving as a board member for one of the oldest centers in New Haven, the Eli Center for Contemporary Art. Uh, she's very excited to talk about Capital's Place-Based Education Consortium, the Hartford Heritage Project. First, we're gonna start with Stacy Queen. So thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So good evening, everyone. And certainly thank you for taking time out um, this evening um, just to share in a great conversation here this evening. Um, I certainly wanna thank Stacy and Shannon and Workspace for inviting me to take part in this really, really um, important conversation. Um, I don't know, I've just, you know, I've been kind of like feeling like I'm in a fog over the past couple of months for many reasons. So um, it feels good to like talk to people and see faces and not having a mask and to see everyone's faces. So again, thank you all for having me this evening. So this first slide that we see here, um, you know, certainly as you can see, it reads um, Black Lives Matter. And that's me kind of standing um, towards the, um, the left of the, the, the sign. And so this actually is, I mean, it's street art. This is da at downtown Columbus, Ohio. And right after the, um, the murder of George Floyd that you know many of us witnessed, um, the city just kind of went into um, like military mode. And a lot of the businesses downtown in Columbus began to, um, you know, they began to put boards up just to protect, you know, the facades of the building and their, their property. Um, so once the, you know, all this plywood went up, it, it just, the downtown looked really desolate and it looks kind of scary. So, you know, as we witnessed a lot of what we saw, you know, happening, not, not just across the country, but across the world in protests to the murder of George Floyd, um, people took to the streets. And we also coupled with that, you know, that horrific moment, we were dealing, we were and still are dealing with a global pandemic. Um, so I think many, many people, you know, I'm not speaking for everyone, but, you know, just like they wanted to release anger or stress or built up tension. Um, so again, in downtown Columbus and in many cities across the country and the, again, the world, you know, we, the street art, this graffiti started to kind of like rise like a, a rose out of the concrete. And I thought that it was, a lot of it was just simply beautiful. I didn't know, you know, the artists behind it or any organizations or any organized um, you know, groups that were creating this art, but I knew that I wanted to capture the moment. I knew that I wanted to pick up my camera and just go out into the streets, you know, always being very safe, but I wanted to, um, to really document what we were seeing, like in the summer of 2020, 
because certainly this was a, a moment that I had never experienced anything like this. Again, with you know businesses closing and so many people dealing with unemployment and just the uncertainty of the moment. Um, so I really wanted to, um, to to take my camera and kind of hit the streets. And certainly, um, as an African American woman, um, the the entire Black Lives Matter movement it, it kind of started with the the death of Jamal Martin that I'm sure many of us remember um, some time ago. And I, I kind of still deal with that. I am the mother of, of, of a young black man. He's 19 years old. And I think about him a lot when he goes out into the world and how he's viewed as, as a person. You know, he's young, he's black. So what does, what, does, what does that carry for him? And how do people, you know, ordinary citizens or the police, how, you know, his interaction with others um, again, really resonates. And I think about that a lot, again, as a mother. And I do also have a daughter as well. I think about her as well. Um, recently, we, we heard about the, the, the murder of Breonna Taylor. You know, my daughter's young. She's in her 20s. She has an apartment. You know, so again, these moments um, that really speak to the Black Lives Matter um, movement, I think about a lot. We can go to the next slide. So speaking of Breonna, Breonna Taylor, this this was another um, bit of, sh of street art or graffiti um, that again was kind of, you know, it, it was like a, a long row of plywood. And again, these artists, and some of them, they did leave a name or an organization um, that they're with, but this was just another, I thought really, really beautiful um, piece of art that really resonated with me. So as you can see, it's a, a woman of color and she has this big, beautiful hair or an Afro. And within um, her hair, you can read the names of Breonna Taylor or Sandra Bland or Corinne Gaines. And these are again, all um, women of color who lost their lives to um, violence that was perpetrated against them. Some by the police, um, Sandra Bland's death was kind of a mystery because she died in her jail cell after she was pulled over by the police. Um, so again, I, I'm, I'm looking constantly at this artwork in my community and wondering just, you know, as the artists were creating these works of art, I'm just finding the beauty, kind of like the beauty and the pain that these artists were really, really creating, creating this work, this body of work. We can go to the next one. And this is, again, just some, some more um, pieces of work that were along um, the downtown Columbus, Ohio. So you can see, like, this is a really fancy building. I believe this is one of the bank buildings in downtown Columbus. So if you can see, like, right behind the, um, the boards, you know, it's, it's all glass. So it like one day downtown looked perfectly normal. You know, buildings are pretty pristine. Um, like um, Stacy kind of mentioned, beautiful architecture that really defines a city. And then overnight, you know, these boards go up. And then you come back a couple of days later, this artwork appears. So we talked a little bit um, earlier, Stacy, Shannon, and Valerie and I, we talked a little bit about art being responsive and what how art is really reflective of the moment that we're living in. So again, these are just um, a few other images that were also um, part of that kind of downtown city landscape um, as a response to um, the George Floyd situation. Stacey, I just wanna um, point out the dichotomy between the boards being put up to protect from the ugliness and violence mm -hmm. that we can quote unquote expect from that community. <laughs> and then what resulted in was their contribution of this beautiful art that is so, um, I mean, sh shines a mirror on the society in really a, not only a provocative, but a healing way, I think. Yeah, it was, again, like, exactly. I totally agree. You know, I, I was, again, always thinking about, like you said, this juxtaposition of 
you know, a regular downtown and then some violence happens and, you know, police brutality happens in another city. But so, I mean, if you watch the local news this summer, you, you, every night was a protest in cities across America and kind of like a complete transformation where, you know, again, a lot of businesses shut down um, and that was kind of due to the pandemic. So, so we're dealing with two um, really, really distinct situations here that if you saw the movie, The Perfect Storm, they kind of both converged on us as a society. Um, we know that police brutality is not new, um, especially to African-Americans, black and brown bodies. Um, if we think about, um, you know, 1619 and the way that African-Americans were enslaved and how police used to police those black bodies then. Um, you know, we think about the relationship that black and brown people have with law enforcement. Um, so I completely agree that it, it just, it, it, I was really in like a weird space because things just did not feel like very normal at all. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, um, this is my um, 19 year old son. So I, I would consider myself a very amateur photographer, but I love to use my family and friends <laughs> as part of my work. Um, so again, he, I just took, picked up my camera and he and I hit the streets and we were, um, this was a little bit further away from downtown Columbus. Um, but again, it, I love street art and graffiti. So I just picked a backdrop and just told him to pose. And of course, as you can see, this is during the pandemic, he has on a mask and he has on gloves because you know, we wanna make sure we're, not, we're touching things with being safe. Um, but he just took to some posing. And this was one that, um, that really, I thought was really um, you know, quite provocative. Um, I don't wanna compare him to Jesus on the cross, but the position of him with his arms extended or we could look at it like hands up, don't shoot. So, so many ways that when I in, um, include family and friends in my work, or if, it's, if I'm just kind of like playing back and just like taking some, doing some photography of just everyday citizens going about their, their daily activities, you know, it's just amazing what we capture when people are in their natural environment. Um, so this, this image, um, you know, I posted on social media and a lot of my friends commented on the image and just considering him as a, a black body in 2020 and as a young man and all the sto stories that we hear unfold on the news and, and you know, and, and on social media of the way, um, the ways in which American society views black bodies. Um, so this was certainly, um, this is a meaningful image for me. Now here I am, this is actually on July 4th, this summer, 2020. So I did a post um, and the question I, uh, I posed was, can African-Americans celebrate Juneteenth and 4th of July? So I, I, it made for a really, really engaging conversation. Um, but this image, again, it just, I was in a funny, a funny, headspace. So I picked up my camera. I went downtown. It was early on 4th of July. It was a beautiful day in Columbus, um, Ohio. And I knew I wanted to like capture some red, white, and blue. Um, I personally love July 4th. Um, so I think that, you know, as a country, we should be able to celebrate Juneteenth um, and the history behind Juneteenth, as well as July 4th and the history of July 4th especially understanding that um, African-Americans have always played a pivotal part in Ameri American history. So I took to the streets again with my camera and sometimes I need help because if I'm gonna be in the picture, I can either use a remote control to take the picture with a tripod or I can just um, have a friend, I can, I can like position myself in the setting and have a friend just hit the clicker. But, um, really quickly, this was really unique because if you can see the police car is also in, in this image. This is downtown Columbus, Ohio, 4th of July. It's a holiday. Again, the streets were like empty, completely empty, but there was such a heavy police presence. So again, it, I'm thinking about how police are policing the streets. 
policing the activities of um, citizens just going about their daily activities. Um, so I was, and I never felt like I've, I've been followed by the police or the police were watching me. But in that moment that I was holding up a scarf under a flag just downtown, that the police, um, you know, they, they, they had a great presence. So again, I'm thinking about police and the way that they interact with, with people of color or people who they think are going to do damage to property um, and how we can relate um, in these moments and understand what's happening um, in, in the society that we live in. Um, this is a, an image. I just grabbed this image from Google, um, from Google Images, and I also provided Stacy with the link. So, if you want the link to, to the next few images that you're going to see quickly, um, so if you think about the art that was being created um, again on on these plywoods that they, they were protecting and boarding up buildings, but we also really saw this um, emerging art on buildings. And of course, with the murder of George Floyd, we saw a lot of, of artwork with his face and using his image. And what does that mean, again, in representing um, the Black body? As a Black man who's no longer, longer with us, however, his, kind of his legacy continues visually because we, you know, again, if you Google murals of George Floyd, you know, tons of images pop up from on buildings all across the country. So I, I, I think about that a lot as well, the way that we're responding to the moment and the way that we're kind of like memorializing um, his legacy and his the representation of him as a Black man. I also, I want to invite people if they do want to say anything, because George Floyd's image more than most was reproduced in so many different ways. And I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts or feelings about seeing this image or the ones that they saw or the video footage mm -hmm. of, you know, a man's knee on his neck. Mm -hmm. Feel free to unmute yourself if you do want to say anything. And, you know, it was for me personally, it was, of course, certainly difficult to watch that the video and then the constant replaying. And I think a lot of news outlets were really sensitive about like that moment when he just like, he just stopped saying, I can't breathe or, you know. Um, so yeah, it, it is, it's, it's still not easy today to, to watch and to think about him. And I think about his daughter a lot, you know, she, uh, that little girl who no longer has her dad and what yeah. life will, will be like for her. Can I ask something? Yes, Matthew. Hi. Uh, one of the issues uh, that I think we have to contend with, and you've mentioned it several times, how the nation feels, how black males are portrayed. I, I have a problem with the universality of that. I, I have a hard time thinking about any cohort in terms of 100%, all women are, all black men are, all white people are, all police are. And the art that's being shown tends to create a stereotypical view. Not, I can't believe that all black people think alike, all white people think alike. And I think there's a missing link here when we say, let's look at the term violence, people who live in violent situations. They're not all black, they're not all white or Asian. If you had to look for a nexus nationwide, worldwide of people who live in violent conditions, if you couldn't use race, what metric would you use? Who are the people who live in violence? Uh, 
Um, just to, to kind of address that kind of question, and it, it could be a rhetorical question, but no, it's I think- not, it's not, No, it's a real question. It's not oh, rhetorical. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I would have to answer that question. If you didn't look at, at race, you probably could look at class oh, or so socioeconomic backgrounds, poverty. Yeah. I think poverty would play a, a, a huge role in 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 violence in in certain in certain parts of the world, not just here in, in the U.S. Any place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And see, that that's that's my concern. That if 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 we look at this, I, I'm 82 years old, so I, I I've lived through a lot of this stuff, real not newspaper, real life. And if we look at how many middle-class black people were there in the 50s? You were probably talking about 10, 15%. If you look in 2020, the statistics would probably say about 40% of people would be considered economically, socially. In, in, and if we look at the life changes for that class of people, it, it there's really been a good move. If we look yeah, at the but, poverty level in the 1950s and the lifestyle of that poverty level, it's not much different today. We just, in Hartford, we had to just, you know, the buildings, the, the people are forced to live with rats and mold and stuff like that because po poor people don't count in this country. And it has nothing to do with race. Poor people in Appalachia are treated poorly by the police, by the government, by their neighbors in Hartford. And my concern is that if we don't take serious looks at the class situation, we're not going to solve much. Because if you are a middle class black person, and you live in a mixed community because Manchester is a wonderful place. We, we're loaded with mixed communities. We have a great Muslim population. We have a, a mix of white, black, and that that areas that have mixed populations that would be, if you allow me calling them middle class, there's a great homogeneity. There's no crime there, but there's crime downtown. And it's not because a lot of minorities live downtown. It's because that's where our impoverished people live. Matthew, and I don't think that's for, getting um, enough play. Yeah. Thank you for, for bringing that up. It, it is something to, to think about. Um, I <laughs> Having done work with somebody who was researching Martin Luther King, and according to her research towards the end of his life, he came to regret the focus on race as the primary when he did think it was the economic. As Liz said in her um, comment here, you can't separate the race from economics because of the way the systemic the economic system works, it is disadvantaged to black and brown people. So there's definitely a connection and it's great to bring it up in these topics to realize how integrated everything is and how holistic a solution a solution must be. Uh, can, can I? Yeah, can who I, was speaking? Pat. Hi, Pat. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, so is it a very challenging question that's on the table? And Matthew, I, I certainly understand your your frame of reference and your framework and where you're coming from. And also the question of economics versus race. But I, I, I think it's important for us to take a look backwards and look at the, the evolution of um, knowledge and wealth and, and um, where the race came from and how closely it was related to money and power. Um, the question of not looking at race is almost a non sequitur because since the 1600s, 
I mean, there was a time when there were not like white people or people weren't white and black. 1600s, we're talking about land and ownership. And somebody said, okay, you black people, you can no longer own anything. You can no longer, um, you can't testify against a white person. And also, by the way, you're not, you're not fully human and you're not acceptable. Now from that construct, we have evolved with a psychological frame of reference that really is not about race per se, because even those of us that believe that race is real, it is elusive what it is. You know, it's yellow, it's red, it's black, it's white. No, it's not about race. Race is a, a it's, it's like a linchpin that informs us of who we are and who different others are. And it informs us through what people essentially look like. And when we get to the question of middle class, I mean, economically, 7.5% of the wealth <laughs> is shared between the poor and the middle class. So there almost is no middle class per se. However, the question of wealthy black people is a whole different question because wealth free you from the experiences and consequences of being a person of color. Even among people of color, it doesn't do that. Yeah. And, and you ask, I, I sat about 40 years ago in Hartford with 20 black males from people who were homeless to heads of corporations. And the, the saddest of them were the ones that were at the highest levels when they really talked about what it felt to be black at, at the end of that ceiling and you knew you weren't going any further. And in the final analysis, you were treated when the knit grits like a black person. <laughs> so uh, to separate the concept of, and, and with full you know, admission that race does not exist as we see it, it's kind of ridiculous. We're talking about, you know, uh, melanin, carbon, and mutations. But when we talk about the way that we have been programmed and, and mentally made ill, not, not just white people, black people as well, who have absorbed construct that what we look like determines what we are. So I think we put it to economics and I agree that poor white people catch hell as well. However, you can put on a three-piece suit and a tie and you can sit on my best. A black person, no. We're, black people aren't even noticed unless they show up in many aspects of many institutions. So I think to take that off the table would be to ignore the level of internal and personal exploration and, and understanding that each of us need to do if we're really serious about this. No, and, and I, I agree with most of what you said. I'd like to share two anecdotes I had with you. Uh, after the riots, I had to go to a, a meeting at Sand School in the north end of Hartford as a representative of the Board of Ed. And there were two women there from the Black soror uh, Service Sorority, and oh. they sat in the, they sat in the uh, the audience, and they began to speak. And the woman in charge of the Sand School, and this is almost a quote; it's burned into my mind. She said, "No, no, you don't talk here. You do not come down from West Hartford in your Mercedes and tell us how to live. You know nothing about how we live here." You want to talk, come down here and live. On the flip side of that, when I was in West Hartford and I was making a plea for Project Concern, which is now Project Choice, bringing minority students into West Hartford, I wanted to expand the program because I thought it was so beneficial. And I did this whole thing about how tough it was to be black and the needs and how we could really help. And this man came to me, a black man and said, Mr. Borelli, I know what you're trying to do, but 
not all black people are alike, and he walked away. My issue is not, I am not ignoring race. It's a real factor, but I'm having a problem that not all black people see the world the same, are treated the same, and poor people of all colors are absolutely universally treated poorly. I, I would well, Matthew and Pat, I'm gonna break in here because this is a really valid conversation. I don't think anybody is um, saying that all people of any um, group see things the same. I wanna bring it back to the artwork. Um, well, that's where I wanted to go. Where we is more, We have more slides to go through and another speaker. So I love the richness of this conversation and there's so much more to do and we're hoping to do more programs and bring people together, not only to talk about these things, but also to talk about, well, how can we create these awarenesses and bring them into, you know, integrate them in society with positive results and concrete change. Um, to that end, I'm just gonna give a plug on January 9th and 10th, 10th, there is an equity symposium. There'll be events happening all day on Saturday and Sunday virtually. So there'll be a lot more great conversations. Um, before we leave this slide, Stacy, I want to say, and I'm not proud of it, but I think that this is the forum for it. If you were to show me a picture of this man without me knowing who he was or being aware of that situation, to me, this seems like that, as, that stereotypical threatening black man. He's big, his features are different than mine. He's but has been presented through the media, this image as a thug. And, that, and I understand the, the controversial nature of that word, but when I see this picture and knowing the story, it breaks my heart open. And I think that's the power of art is to thrust something in our face and make us think about it differently. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so I just wanna um, wrap up with just some artists who have influenced me in my current practice and kind of thinking about ways that we're using art to deal with um, the pandemic or any, you know, the social unrest or the issues of race, gender, um, you know, class structure um, that, you know, we've kind of been talking about this evening. So we can go to the next. And really quickly, this is an image, you know, we, we were inundated with rallies this summer, but this is a great image from James Vanderzee in 1924. And this was at a rally for uh, Marcus Garvey in Harlem, New York. So as we think about the ways that artists have captured moments um, that were um, during times where, you know, society had a lot of, you know, issues with race. And if you know the story of Marcus Garvey, he was sometimes considered a, a controversial image in black, an individual in black culture. So I, I, this image really, really speaks to um, this kind of coming together of people of color in Harlem um, at a, 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 a rally about race relations in the country. Next. Um, again, this is um, another image, that a, a painting that has influenced my work by Jacob Lawrence. This is part of the migration series. And I just really want to point out, you, out of all the, the bodies in this painting, you can only see two faces. And those two faces are of police, policing black bodies. So you see the backs of the people of color, and this is the... Um, representing, again, the great migration from the South and African-Americans are moving North to a lot of cities, you know, looking for job opportunities, better housing, better schooling for their children. Um, but the two faces that we see in this painting are uh, of the two police. And last but not least, um, Emery Douglas, who was the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. Um, you know, his, his um, iconic images, images really um, captured that moment during the, the 60s when the Black Panther Party was really um, relevant to the movement. And you know, they, the Black Panther Party, they wanted to police the police. And these images um, that were created by Emory Douglas really, really spoke to that moment. So just as artists are speaking to, to the pandemic, and the, the kind of senseless violence that we see against black and brown bodies today, this is not new. Artists have over 
decades, centuries have always been responding to moments that, that they were living in. And, you know, Valerie, I'm going to give you the floor next. But again, thank you for allowing me um, to share some of my work in photography and the, you know, what I'm thinking about as we're living through um, this kind of year of 2020 and actually about to step into 2021. So hopefully things will, you know, days will be right ahead as we enter into a new year. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me tonight for the community conversation. Thanks to Stacy and Shannon at uh, Workspace. Um, I was in there today checking out the exhibit and I um, found great peace walking around the artwork. I found that I slowed down. Um, the stress of a finish to a busy semester had been getting to me. Um, I was fresh off a doctor's appointment and walking into the space, I was greeted and I had time to meander. And I love the way it's organized and the sheer volume of all the work. So I imagine tonight that most of you here attending are artists in the show. And so I'm gonna try to frame my talk accordingly. Um, I also am sitting here looking at my um, outline of slides and as Matthew and Patricia have been speaking, um, I'm, I'm thinking to myself how many people of color are you going to see in my photographs? And you will see some, but you'll also see some screenshots of my online teaching. And I think that's where we start to see the color disappear. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about um, online teaching. And I think that's relevant for you all because as artists, maybe you do run workshops yourselves. Um, but I don't want to do it in a vacuum where we are immune to understanding that going online in school has really shown a light on the um, uh, disparity among resources and how it's not so seamless as, as it should be. That said, um, I want to focus on the positives, um, some of the unexpected happy outcomes of moving online with learning art. Um, and look at where we might be um, going during a pandemic. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to a couple of the artists in the show whose statements really um, rang true. So I'll launch into my slides in just a second, but I think it was really um, quite poignant that Trey Brooks, one of the artists, um, termed 2020 a roller coaster. I feel the same exact way. And it's not over yet. Um, and Sarah Siamaya. Um, has said in her statement on the wall, 2020 has shined the light on multiple diseases in society. So what I'm going to do is walk you through what um, moving to online learning in teaching art has looked like for me, um, but also culminate in showing you a few different uh, projects that I designed for my students tackling what Sarah has termed multiple diseases in society. It's not just a pandemic. It's a plague of systemic racism and so many other things uh, included. So here we are, we're looking at the old G Fox building, which is Capital Community College. And this is my um, front door to work. This is the main lobby. So we're a vertical campus and the art studio is on the 11th floor. Uh, the elevators uh, look different now. The floor looks different now. I find it interesting too that this photo, which I borrowed from another presentation is almost downcast. Um, what, you, what you don't know, but what I know is that closer to the front of the building is the art gallery at Capitol, um, which has been closed since the start of the pandemic as well. So it's a quiet time at Capitol. There are some classes going on, especially um, clinical nursing programs. But uh, for the most part, I've only been there a handful of times this past semester because I had one uh, online um, for, um, sorry, hybrid painting class. And so we can go to the next slide. And this is what it looks like in the room. This is what baking art, and some of you might know this, together in person now looks like. Um, wearing a mask, uh, there's hand sanitizer at every table. We rely heavily on our sink. And um, it's stuffy, you know, we don't really have too much ventil ventilation in the room as it is. And the numbers are halved and halved again. Uh, it was nice to get in person and make art together, but a lot of the students have indicated that they feel safer staying at home. So um, come spring, all of the classes for art will be live remote online learning, meaning scheduled time together virtually. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. 
Oh, back one, back, back. Yeah, so some of the things we lose when we're not in the classroom, uh, and these are, you know, resources, are the ability to set up a studio. As art students who maybe never took a painting class before, there is not an easel at home necessarily, nor is there, and we love this tool, the tracing box uh, or cubbies to store work. Um, and when we got together in this hybrid class, I had us do a couple of sessions in the beginning just to talk about how to set yourself up at home or if you um, need a place to mix your paints, you can take a, a piece of glass out of an old picture frame or you can use some discarded Tupperware lids, um, making do with what we might have at home. Okay, next slide. And here too, what I lose is the ability to demo with my um, drop down screen and my chalkboard and my setup and all of that. Um, so on to the next slide. Here is what's coming in spring. We're rocking and rolling with our, I'm a year and a half new to Capitol um, and I am based in New Haven, but in Hartford a lot of the time while I do my teaching. And um, on the back end, we're doing a lot of overhaul in the curriculum design, um, mostly because we haven't had a lot of art majors at Capitol. Um, the student body is very much a nursing student body. Um, but they love art there and they really appreciate seeing it and making it. We're in a great place downtown where um, when it's not a pandemic, there are so many cultural resources to explore. Um, so this gives you a little insight to what the, the leg we're, we're doing in the background to plan and, and keep these classes rolling um, to diversify all of the other aspects of the majors the students have. Okay, on to the next, please. Okay, so now you're in um, my personal space. And I was thinking too, as Stacey was talking, the, the boarded up Columbus, Ohio, in some ways is like my capital with stickers all over the floor and you know, like a ghost town. It's a jarring realization that the architecture around us has changed so drastically. Um, so when, when we go online learning and when I do online teaching, this is now the new studio, right? It's filled with um, my screens and my dog and my family, right, and my home. Um, and so we're sharing personal spaces and things get uh, challenging and tricky because I don't know if any one of you artists have tried to demo or record yourself doing a drawing, everything's all flipped. So if I drew that um, wine bottle and started talking about proportion and sighting and measuring, um, the camera capturing it wasn't necessarily, you know what I mean, the view is like ricocheting all around. So um, it's been kind of funny and kind of crazy. Uh, and I've been fortunate to have the resources to try to make it work. And ultimately, um, now having taught two drawing classes, I think I'm getting a little bit better at it. Um, okay, next slide, please. Valerie, I hate to interrupt you for a technical thing, but there is a setting on in your Zoom settings where you can hit mirror view. Ah, thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm learning this all the time. That's awesome. Yeah, and I do feel among friends with you all because I talk to the other um, the other art professors at the community colleges and they help me and I am so excited to see, oh, the uh, workspace gallery has this whole network of artists. I mean, it seems like you all already know each other and that's really warming. So thank you for that. Um, and so this is what I see when I'm looking at the screen and I'm teaching. So my little still life is set up there. But but again, I bring this up to show you that like, you know, people's kids pop in view and um, there's a lot of background noise and it it just gets a little bit um, crazy sometimes. And it's very, very different from being in person. It's a different uncomfortableness than having a mask in a stuffy room. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Now this is sometimes how an online teaching class looks. We can luckily look at students' artwork together as well as reference photos. And what we were doing in this, in this um, room, in this meeting, um, was picking apart value in this portrait. So we're about two thirds of the way through the semester and we're really starting to talk about and focus on how, okay, well maybe we could add a little highlight to the lower lip um, and change maybe some of the line work and the direction. Um, and also the ability for the artist to make a, a conscious design to say, I wanted a red shirt. I didn't want a white shirt. I didn't quite know how to handle that. So um, I wanted to tell you guys that something I found that's been really helpful in teaching art um, this way is that my students don't turn in a paper like they would in another class where the teacher reads and grades the paper. Everything my students create, they put um, on Blackboard, our learning modality, and everybody can see each other's stuff. 
and everybody can comment on each other's stuff. So it's like a work group. Um, and there is a real, um, you know, like a virtual critique happening often. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, this too. I don't know if you guys know about um, Croaky Cafe, but there are pre-recorded uh, life drawing videos, hundreds of them, honestly. It's a um, really interesting thing. And a timer beside these live shaking nude figure models. Uh, so we sit and we draw together and we spend um, you know, the one minute poses, we'll do a couple of them and then hold up all our artwork and look at it together. And so this has been a really collaborative um, experience to draw in real time with each other, um, watching something on the computer. You could do this in the classroom, but it is sometimes confusing um, and uncomfortable and new for especially students who are brand new to art or having a live model in front of them. Okay, next slide. So um, I have two slides after this. And what I'm moving into now is showing you some of the projects that I've um, created and the students have helped inspire. Uh, and they go in order from sort of coming off of that spring semester where we hard and fast went online, um, went home and then didn't go back. Um, and so in spring 2020, what I would have had the students do in drawing one, and these are amazing for drawing one, I hope you agree, is um, move into the figure for the very final project and do a self-portrait. For this project, I asked them to do a pandemic self-portrait. And I said, if you're, no, if you're not comfortable drawing yourself, you know, we've all had these videos on and been looking inside each other's spaces, you can do a symbolic self-portrait instead. So I did have some where there wasn't even a figure in here, but rather a still life of hand sanitizer and elements that were symbolic of the pandemic. Um, I also said you could take a famous person or a famous portrait and put a mask on it. So that's why we see the Ferris Bueller poster and then the, the Andy Warhol Marilyn with the mask on top. Um, at this point in the semester, we've gone through talking about measuring and proportion and value. Um, and the students have not been just relying on drawing from a photograph, but here they're able to do so. And I think they were really proud of how these turned out. Okay, next slide. This is a, a summer drawing class, so six weeks, um, super fast, uh, all online. And I, at this point in the semester, was talking about um, landscapes. And I asked the students to, um, to draw a place that they, knowing we can't go anywhere, would like to go. And I love that top left corner one because the student there had a memory years ago of going to uh, the Eiffel Tower. And she said, you know, you said anywhere, dream big, I would go back, I would go back to that. And I think there's something to that about perhaps all of us wanting to go back to a time when the pandemic was not going on, when it didn't exist. Um, and then this, this one on the bottom right, I believe is uh, an image from a place in a show, maybe it's Downton Abbey or something similar. And I think about that too, that, you know, we were watching um, myself and my husband, um, Ozark, the TV show, and joking way back about, well, we could just go visit the Ozarks. It's so beautiful out there, despite the subject matter of the show. And it's not so simple now to just see something and go, um, you know, conceptually think like that's somewhere one day I will go, you know, resources aside. Now you can't, you can't get a flight to where you want to go. You can't um, leave the state without looking up travel restrictions and on and on. Okay, next slide. Finally, this last project that I wanted to talk about um, is much bigger than the art program. The humanities department had a larger initiative, and there's a link in my last slide, slide to the blog, um, focusing on the, uh, the writer and activist James Baldwin. Now, in this point, in this fall, this semester, um, my students in both drawing and painting were working on landscapes. So we're right after still lives, and we're right before the figure. And they've covered value and they've covered a perspective. Um, and I had them uh, use a picture that they took uh, and, and render that image and then apply a, a James Baldwin quote. And I had a sign up genius list so we didn't overlap on quotes and they all had to hop on and pick. This is another neat thing that comes out of um, being so acclimated to being online. You know, just go over here and pick your quote and that's that. Um, 
what's really beautiful in the second one here is you're looking at a scarecrow and this is a, a larger story came through on the wiki which is the, the place that we put all of the artwork and everyone can see each other's stuff the artist statement was that she made this scarecrow while working at um, a nursing facility with the patients so she was bonding over a, a you know a childlike activity something that um, brought back memories for her but was like an accessible um, exercise that um, made you know the the depression of the workplace lighten up a little bit and then she made art out of it you know she then made a photo and then she then made a drawing and, and there's a beautiful quote you know she had the latitude to pick from quite a few that she added underneath I actually don't remember it offhand now but um, we did some cool things in this I don't know if any of you have tried pencil transfers but it's a great way to get text on paper we were looking at fonts and letter design so um, so you can go to the next slide. So these are just a couple of links. Um, I, I hope that it's relevant what I'm talking about with you all today. And I so appreciate what Stacey was talking about before and the insight into looking at another city uh, and seeing um, what's been coming out of the collective trauma of this pandemic. Um, I do wanna stay on a really positive note and say that like teaching gives me lift and as an artist to work with art students, I'm always learning all the time too. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's obvious that it gives you a lift, your, your passion and enthusiasm as you're talking about the work and the students and the positives that have come out of the virtual um, connections. Uh, so thank you very much and thank you for your kind words about the exhibit. Um, it was Shannon's idea to paint the some of the walls yellow, including the front facing um, wall to Main Street. And it's amazing how color alone um, really impacts and to be conscious of the, the power of art during these challenging times. Um, and the workspace logo is black and white and gray. So we're, we're working to, to figure out which, how to incorporate pops of color in that because it does have, you know, definitely does have a, an impact. I love the mural on the back of the building too. I snuck around back after in the car. It's great on the backside. I love it. Yes. And that was, that became the emblem for the perspective show, which we um, launched last year. Pat Johnson is on this in this conversation uh, was the coordinator for that show called Perspectives. We are all different. We are all one. Um, and the town um, itself is working hard to, to although they're, we're in the early stages of really growing a more um, socially aware and equitable government and community. Um, so that was the proposal that was put out to artists to find some sort of image that would represent the diversity and the growth. And we've got, for people who don't know, it's brightly colored arrows going in all um, different directions. So Can I ask you, a question? Thank you for noticing that. Yes, Matthew. Uh, do you have to be a uh, community college uh, person to take the course, the art course? Well, you'd have to register, you know, but you don't have to be degree seeking. Okay, so a poor person who dropped out of school could take your course. Well, what's really exciting is just this year, um, there's been some new changes with the legislature in Connecticut. And so they're trying to make community college free to at least those who, you know, meet certain conditions, like are the first person in their family to get a degree, or there's a ceiling on the family income. Um, much of that is still be to develop, and I'm really hopeful with the incoming administration that community colleges will get a lot more support. Um, I also, I know that you can audit courses. Um, I just am not too fluent on how that works. Um, I try to bring us out into the community too, um, to um, hopefully one day do something like a, a mural class to do some public art in downtown Hartford, where of course I would be seeking participation from those who are not enrolled in the school. But you bring up a really good point that there, it, it can be very cost prohibitive. We have a great scholarship program. I think we do a lot, but we could do more. Well, that, that's excellent that you don't have to be a degree seeking because we're, we're depriving a great number of people who are poor, who are dropouts 
from a beautiful experience because you have to be educated to get educated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not right. Can I ask you one other question about, about distance learning? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to bore you with my three theme on poverty, that the number of poor kids and young adults that you teach who are in impoverished backgrounds, the one that have internet is small, who have a reliable life situation that's organized to say, at seven o'clock, we're going to go to Zoom and do this. Our poor kid don't come from homes like that. And, and, and uh, again, the poor people in this country and in this state can't take advantage of a lot of good stuff that's going on. So I'm very glad that if I were a high school dropout and I was minimally employed, that I could come to you and take an art course and I don't have to be a high school graduate or enroll in a community college. Is that correct? No, you have to be enrolled. You have to enroll with capital. And I think that you would need to show proof of um, primary education before doing well, so. Well, so so I, I can't take your course if I'm a dropout? I'm not really sure about that, but it's a really good point. Um, and and if, if, if not, we need to advertise this because that population could use art a lot more than other Absolutely. people. Absolutely. I feel very privileged and proud to be working in the community colleges as yes. a, a, as a great role between high school and perhaps future degrees or career. Uh, it is a different teaching experience than, let's say, private uh, institutions. Thank you. And so for anybody who is um, on this it, um, call, if you know of classes and opportunities and resources, um, please always share them and tag uh, Workspace, our, we're um, at Workspace Manch, M-A-N-C-H, um, and then we will share it or notify us at the galleries and we will try to share it um, with our network with the hope that they will share it with the people that, that we don't reach. Um, I do want to bring the conversation again um, back to art and the way that we opened this call was with these four images. And we have over 150 different works of art, including um, Gwen's pictures and Matthew's poems. And who else? Corey had pictures. Arpita had to drop off um, the call. And it's such a diverse range of perspectives, which is why we call it perspectives of a pandemic. These are only four. We have St. Pfeiffer's work in the top left. The top right is by Katie Fogg. The bottom right is Andre Shaparo. That's mixed media. And the left is actually a community college student, Jordan Hughes, bottom left. So I'm just wondering if any of these spoke to anyone and if you feel comfortable sharing um, what reaction does, does it come out at you with some pronouncement or do you feel that it draws you in? So feel free to open up your microphone and share. I'll say one thing briefly, and that is I appreciate that you have taken a track of opening your gallery to, to social kinds of things, to things that are important to human beings in the moment, and that you've done that consistently. I, I, they did with you, but I, I watch you and you're doing that and you should be congratulated for that because many people aren't on that tip. The other thing is that that art to, to my involvement in it has to do with two basic things and that's experience, communication, actually three, and expression. And there's so much right now that we need to be able to communicate about. And the arts have just an amazing way to communicate expression and experience and give us the opportunity to then take that, expand our own selves and share that one with another. So keep doing what you're doing, Stace. And you know, people we need to keep talking. I mean, um, Matthew, I agree with you that some of the things that are happening in impoverished households are, are, are sad, etc. 
But there's a flip side of that. And that has to do with the creativity, the richness, the expression, the knowledge, and the experience and the worldview that people bring up out of those experiences that enrich us all. And we can see through the art through our own personal experience. So, you know, I, you know I'm going to go back to we we're all different. We we're all one. But the arts are an amazing avenue for the changes that we all can be. And thank you, Stacey. You bad. B A B B. Oh, bad. thank you. Thank you very much. I will tell you that um, we're going to be doing a lot more shows like this. We're hoping our perspective show is um, next year is going to be perspectives of home, which will again be whatever artists interpret it. Lovely memories of their childhood home to the housing disparity due to economics and poverty. Um, so that's gonna be a rich program, but we're also planning to uh, support our local breweries by doing an exhibit of beer label art. So it's, it's the full range we're, we're gonna offer. Um, in promoting this program as well, we talked about, and we haven't, didn't have time to focus on it tonight, but we thought about when you look back at other periods of trauma and civic un unrest, um, if you just Google it, Time Magazine, you know, did a whole program or a, a whole magazine in May on the art that came out of the Spanish flu pandemic. And it, it's really interesting to think about these artists here that we're looking at now could a century from now be on the cover of Time Magazine when God forbid we go through another one of these um, experiences. But just the diversity, the use of color and the style and the movement in these pictures, as well as the pictures that um, Stacy and Valerie showed us. Does anybody, again, have any thoughts before we, we wrap up this conversation or other images that they've seen or art that they've created and how it's helped them cope and um, process their feelings? Gwen, what about you? You're a visual artist as well as an entertainer. How, how has the creation of art helped you since March? You have to unmute. Stacy, I have to go. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, well, it, re it helped me in the way to uh relax and not get so anxious about what i didn't know or the fear of what might happen so that's what my art did to me plus uh prior to um drawing the ones the, the main ones that i left uh in the gallery i was drawing on white sketch paper and then i can't even think it out, but I started drawing on black paper. <laughs> but on the black paper, the colors came out and that made me feel even better because the colors were, were bright and, and they made me feel good. But yet I was, I was painting on the black paper instead of on the white paper. Thank you for sharing. Norm, did you want to share something? Yeah. Uh one of the things I thought that we were going to discuss, and I guess we just didn't get around to it, I didn't speak up soon, was that art is a, doing artwork is a form of healing. Yes. And uh, as Stacy knows, I, I'm a Parkinson's patient, and I've had Parkinson's disease for 13 years now. And sometimes my hand shakes so much, I have to switch hands. Or sometimes I use two hands. But it, it is a form of healing for me. Uh, sometimes I get out my aggression and I do a wild abstract painting. And other times I'll do a landscape or a still life. But it's it's very soothing and that's yeah i i think it's well 
Yeah, thank That's you, Norm. And it, it, it has a, an amazing impact for us because we do have your work not only in this current exhibit, but we've had it throughout the building at different times. And um, in the last exhibit, the Veterans Art Exhibit, he had a picture, of, a large picture um, that he co-created with his grandsons and a woman walking down Main Street um, stopped in and said that she's passed it many, many times and inquired about purchasing it. And in the end, she did purchase it just based on what it looked like and how it made her feel. She didn't know until we told her um, that the painter had Parkinson's, which touched her so profoundly because her grandfather had Parkinson's. Um, and that connection was just lovely that we as, as a community gallery could be able to, to make. And art, I think, it's so important that it's taught in school to children and it's something that we don't give enough attention to, but also that it's um, made readily available for adults to um, process their emotions, as Gwendolyn says, to um, maybe mitigate their fears and also express anger and rage and sadness. Um, and some of the work that Stacy showed us, I'm ass my assumption or what I'm projecting is that that was the motivation and yet it came out in such a beautiful um, lyrical way. So I, I think to open our eyes to the art around us and to what, what we have to contribute by either creating art or talking about art is, is really important to the positive changes we, we wanna see. Yeah, Norm, I just wanna throw in there, the Trump's last stand, that painting, it really stopped me in my tracks. I spent a lot of time with it. It was really powerful. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to say one thing. Stacy Queen, keep doing what you're doing, girl, in Ohio. You can change it. And it's um, one thing we're working on, hopefully, is doing a collaboration of some sort with the Amistad uh, Center. We obviously know that they have um, their own relationship with the Wadsworth Anthenaeum, but we're hoping that maybe for Juneteenth, we could um, do a, a shared exhibit with a company and program. So we're always looking to make those connections and hopefully with Capitol College, because we have a lot of Hartford artists that we're building our, our community. So uh, we really thank you for being here. I wanna um, ask Shannon, who was the majority curator of this exhibit, um, if she wants to say anything else about um, the exhibit and the conversation we had tonight. Thank you, Stacy, and uh, thank you to Valerie and Stacy Q for your um, contributions tonight. For all the participants for joining the conversation, um, it it really makes me feel great just reflecting on um, what you said about your experience today, being in the space because that very much was the intention when we put the show together was to have this this space both to come in and just, um, so and look at art and do with the art, observe the art, draw whatever from if you want to. We really, you know, mount the show this time, we weren't sure what kind of response we would get. And we were overwhelmed with artists who had busy creating um, and using art as a healing tool to work through the feelings that they were having or reconnecting um, with um, medium they hadn't used in ages or in some cases, people picking their pen or pencil for the first time. And um, it was wonderful, the um, of first time ever wanted to but tonight to come together and look at, for example, Jordan's um, rat drawing, which I love because it has so much movement in it. Um, and to know that it's being seen by people um, in our gallery and online um, really resonates. And I think that it is a lot um, to imagine the art that we looked at tonight, the images that Stacy's captured on the streets, the work she's doing her, or the work we're doing with students, uh, that that might reflect, um, as Stacy said, in a hundred years, this could be how people are looking back at this pandemic through the eyes of what we're creating today. So, um, appreciate you all for and sharing and, um, and for sharing your our creativity with us. So to all the artists on the call, thank you. And uh, to panelists, thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much for your um, participation. If you're interested in a, um, another conversation coming up, we do our monthly TED Talk Tuesday. It's the third Tuesday of the month. It's lunchtime. We just do it for 45 minutes, 12.15 to 1 o'clock. So that's next Tuesday. Um, and the artist, Shannon, do you remember his name? I'm drawing a blank. Titus? Yes. I, um, I yeah, he's in front of me. New Haven. Oh, it's the final slide. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I made eyes with the coming shows. Perfect, because we knew that Perfect. we would um, <laughs> that. Here we go. So um, we have the TED Talk Tuesday, Tuesday with Titus Kafar. Uh, Shannon picked this conversation about uh, can beauty open our hearts to difficult conversations uh, well before I texted her um, on Sunday. Are you watching CBS Sunday morning? There's this great artist who founded this great institute in New Haven and it happens to be Titus. Um, so that's going to be a wonderful one. He has a new conversation as well, um, a TED talk. Uh, so those are always uh, good to look into. Michelle Thomas is a member of our community uh, who's currently working, um, living in New York, attending the Pratt Institute, getting her MFA. And she will be leading a painting workshop. We've done this before where we have uh, people pick up supplies at workspace and we do a virtual class. Um, and then Saturday and Sunday, as I mentioned, is the equity symposium. It's gonna be all online, it's free. Um, we have an amazing slate of speakers that we're getting ready to um, make public. And we did this in person last year, one half a day, and now it's, it's evolved from there. And Tuesday, January 12th, we're gonna have Liz Shapiro who is on this call and Ryan Parker who is an educator um, in Manchester as well as the Manchester Poet Laureate are gonna help um, me facilitate a conversation with the artist. So if you're an artist in the perspective of pandemic, we would like you to be on that call and to share your story about the art that you created for the exhibit. Stacy Queen's going to be back on January 19th for our January TED Talk. Um, we don't always watch a film TED Talk. We basically um, either have on occasion a live conversation or watch another uh, video. So that will be lovely. And then Kim Hale, who is also an artist in our community, as well as someone who um, conducts workshops on art therapy for veterans. She's going to be doing another painting workshop for us. So if you're not on our uh, newsletter list, just let me know. Manager at Workspace Manchester or galleries at WorkspaceManchester.com. Those will get to uh, Shannon and I. And um, we just want to thank you all so much. And we're hoping that Ryan Parker, the Poet Laureate, is going to be launching a poetry program from Workspace. It'll, I'm assuming, be virtual until it's not. So. <laughs> There you go. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations to the artists. And thank you so much, Stacy and Valerie. It's really lovely to, to hear your insights and connection um, to art and helping us look through the lens of art as we probably have another, you know, eight to 10 months of this pandemic to deal with and the equity thing even longer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you all. Have a good night. Be well. Stay healthy.